What I'd like to do is explain a little bit the history of, of how we got here. We started in Vail with Dr. Stedman in 1990, I think it was, uh, and it was really a very exciting ride there. We had a great partnership, built a great program and seeing patients, saw a lot of interesting clientele, a lot of athletes and others and regular folk. And, and as part of that, we had our fellowship program and we developed the uh, research side of it with the Stedman Hawkins Sports Medicine Foundation and managed to really solve a lot of problems and, and be very prolific in the academic world of research and education. Now the original vision is really to bring what Hawk has developed in Vail over the years here, which is to create a, a unique place to practice medicine where you had um, physicians that you were used to working with, where you had the integration with all the staff that supports that, physical therapy, sports performance, all the way down to the front office people, the people that answer the phones. Most patients walk into a doctor's office, get an answer, get a diagnosis, and walk out. In this arena, in this, this system that we have put together, the patient walks in, gets to see a physician who has a research background, who has already done the basic science work on a lab table to figure out the answer, now gets to work with the patient, gets to work with a therapist, gets to work with a fitness center to put the whole package together so that when the patient walks out of the room, they know they got the whole answer. The science that we put forth actually proves that the outcomes for the patients are superior to anything else out there, and we make it better every day and every week by applying those scientific factors to it. Over 60 million kids play baseball in the United States. 50% of those at some point during their career will complain of shoulder elbow pain that keeps them from participating in sport. Uh, there's been a documented rise in elbow and shoulder surgeries, in particular in the adolescent athlete. And so we have a particular interest in how to prevent and treat and rehabilitate these injuries. We look at the, the bony anatomy uh, and then soft tissues, the muscles and ligaments around the shoulder and how they influence and are changed uh, by the throwing motion. And so uh, we work uh, every spring, we go out with the Colorado Rockies. Uh, we're fortunate to be able to work with them and see how their uh, pitchers respond over the course of the season to pitching. Uh, we're able to uh, use imaging technology with some of our other partnerships with the foundation uh, to image the shoulder and see how those images change over the course of time. I've been uh, at a number of large institutions, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I have an adjunct appointment uh, with Duke University and the University of South Carolina, but to be here where we have a, a large community uh, of patients that we're able to work with and, and be involved in, in the Greenville uh, school system and then to have the resources from the Orthopedic Research Foundation and Stedman Hawkins clinics really allows us to do a whole different level of research that I don't think there's very many places in the country doing. At Stedman Hawkins, we're always researching innovative ways to uh, help patient care, to create better outcomes. Well, exercise has always been one of those elements, is that um, exercise has proven to be quite beneficial for a lot of different types of medical conditions. However, um, the research is fairly sparse because up to date, there hasn't been a very safe way for individuals, whether they have Parkinson's or traumatic brain injury or even children, to exercise in a very safe manner. And so what we've created is a system that allows us to gather a lot of research, a credible research, and then uh, a piece of equipment, SpeedFlex, that uh, significantly reduces uh, the risk for injury. There's no bars, there's no dumbbells, there's nothing that could fall on um, one of these uh, patients because of imbalances or weaknesses that they may have. For some reason or other, this uh, arena of arthritis and cartilage repair has always been exciting to me. I just remember when I was going through medical school, I used to have the most uh, empathy and feel sorry for the people that were suffering from arthritis, uh, particularly the younger people because they were, you know, they were really hit hard and, and set back significantly. What happens when somebody gets arthritis is that part of their joint is start starting to wear out. Cartilage is normally a, a, a smooth surface that's about a quarter of an inch thick. And when somebody gets an injury to part of that surface, it takes a divot out of it, like a divot in a golf course. 
The next thing you know, that divot enlarges, and that's the time we need to get in there. And what we do when we go in is we scrape away the damaged cartilage down to the bare bone area, then we punch holes in it with a thing that looks like an ice pick. That brings the stem cells out of the bone marrow, which get caught in a blood clot in the defect, and then if we treat that uh, defect right in the post-op rehabilitation and with certain chemicals and everything, it will turn into a new cartilage surface. The research is critical here because what's happened in the past is that we would see a, a group of people that were getting into their 40s and, and early 50s who had major cartilage problems uh, and arthritis problems that had to give up their major uh, uh, athletic activities and more importantly had to give up their high demand jobs if they had a, a high demand type of job. So what we've been able to do is come up with new cartilage regeneration techniques and we're even working on some new ones now that will give rise to a better repair of the cartilage and that'll allow these people to continue being active or uh, continue with their high demand job until they get into their 60s and can take a normal retirement. When we come up with these new techniques and we're able to see them turn from a dis disabled person into an active person, that really is truly exciting. And uh, that's the kind of thing that, that stimulates us to, to come up with new techniques as well as carry them out in the uh, clinics in the operating room. At the Orthopedic Research Foundation of the Carolinas, we're privileged to work alongside such a dedicated group of professionals. Surgeons, physical therapists, athletic trainers, health and performance experts who are all striving to deliver the best possible outcome to our patients. It's reported that one in four Americans actually suffer from an orthopedic disorder. And in the United States this year, almost $850 billion will be spent on musculoskeletal issues. Despite this widespread prevalence, less than 5% of orthopedic surgeons will even conduct research. And orthopedic disorders are not even among the top 10 funded health conditions. Some suggest that we might have an uphill battle, but here we have a dedicated group of professionals. We have great research collaboration within the state of South Carolina. The University of South Carolina, Clemson University, the Greenville Hospital System, University Medical Center, to name a few. Uh, we've been uh, privileged to have support from corporations and institutions and a growing number of individuals who support our cause. And each and every day we are all working together to try to improve people's lives throughout the world through our research. I think the uniqueness of our group relates to not just patient care, but it, but it is centered on patient care and trying to provide a good service, solve problems, help people, which of course which we love to do as orthopedic surgeons and sports medicine doctors. But I think what makes us a little different than maybe some is we try to solve these problems through research and then we share that with the world through education and that really gives us, I think, a little edge or a foot up, if you will, on, on many practices because most practices in our country don't pursue it that way. So I think that aspect of marrying the research and education with our patient care is probably what gives us a little unique advantage in this whole picture of uh, caring for patients in life.